everyone and welcome to our first episode of The Morning Journal. My name is Sarah. And I'm Rachel and I'm so excited for our first episode, I've got to say. We have a lot coming up in the show, but we're going to keep you in suspense. Let's go to Scarlet with the headlines. Thanks for that, guys. Mark Zuckerberg apologised this week for Facebook's recent scandal with data collection agency Cambridge Analytica. The Facebook CEO said that if Facebook can't protect its users' data, then it doesn't deserve to serve them. He also said that he is committed to doing whatever it takes to repair the damage um, and the trust of Facebook users, and that he intends to employ strategic solutions to stop data agencies from acquiring the personal data information of users without their consent. The privacy scandal saw up to 50 million users' information shared with data political strategists Cambridge Analytica. The data agency is reported to have ties with President Donald Trump's administration. Not only that, but the Facebook data um, that was collected may have aided Trump's campaign for presidency. Over the of the 50 million users whose data was taken, only a very small fraction consented to sharing their personal data to a third-party app developer. Zuck Zuckerberg has been called to testify to several committees on the obligations and responsibilities Facebook has to nearly its 2 billion users. Many legal professionals believe that this scandal will be the first of many invest investigations into breaches of privacy for Facebook. The world was shocked over the weekend as the Australian cricket team were caught ball tampering on camera. Cameron Bancroft was charged with ball tampering after television cameras caught him stuffing a piece of yellow tape down his pants. The incident occurred on Saturday um, in Cape Town at the third Test match, match against South Africa. The tape was being used in an illegal attempt to scuff the ball. The leadership team admitted to endorsing the plan. Australian captain Steve Smith and his deputy David Warner stood down from their positions in the team last night for the remainder of the Test matches. Smith said that the integrity of both himself and the game has been damaged from the cheap attempt to tamper with the ball. Legendary former Australian captain Michael Clarke tweeted saying, What the have I just woken up to? Please tell me this is a bad dream. Many other public figures have expressed their disappointment for the Australian cricket team's actions, including Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull and even Warney, who believes cheating is never okay on the field. An Australian version of a uh, America's Time's Up campaign has been launched, very directly titled, Now Australia. The crowdfunding campaign is being led by Australian journalist Tracy Spicer to promote conversations about sexual harassment and provide assistance to survivors. The campaign is led by 30 Australian women ambassadors from a, var a variety of professions. It seeks to stop discrimination for good, with a focus on workplace sexual harassment. Singers such as Missy Higgins, Tina Arena and Sarah Blasco are some of the ambassadors rallying behind now. The organisation will use its funds to conduct research as well as education programs to develop practical solutions to sexual harassment. Over in the US, tens of thousands of people gathered for March for Our Lives, a USA-wide rally to enforce stricter gun laws. The most recent school shooting in Florida claimed the lives of 17 people on February 14th. The words enough and never again could be seen on signs in the sea of crowds. The protesters are demanding the government break the legislative pro protection of gun laws which currently allow everyday citizens the right to bear arms. Around 18,000 people protesters marched at the state capitol in freezing conditions in the hope to end the devastation of gun violence in the US. And finally, it's hard to tell if the internet sensation Grumpy Cat is happy to have won over $700,000 million, uh, sorry, $700, this week in a federal lawsuit over her identity. A lawsuit was filed three years ago against Grenade, a beverage company that used Grumpy Cat to endorse a number of its products. However, Grumpy Cat's owner, Tabitha Bunderson, authorised only one of the products to feature her furry feline, the Grumpy Cat Grumpuccino. The cat appeared in court in front of eight jurors on Saturday who ruled in favour of the cat and her master, granting the pair $710,000. And that's all from news today. Mm, Grumpuccino sounds like something I might actually order myself. <laughs> it's very cute. Very cute, yes. Yeah. Do you, are you guys familiar with Grumpy Cat? Yes, yeah. No, not particularly. Please elaborate. Uh, mm. it, has a, it has an underbite, right. the cat. 
um, and poppy outy eyes. Mm. So mm. an Attractive. ultimate grump face. Mm. Just mm. it just yeah it it permanently looks very grumpy and angry with everything. Right. So it's, yeah. I, I must it's show a you sensation. after. Oh, yes, right. No, today. I'm sure yeah. if I look in the mirror, I'll be happily see the reflection of the grumpy cat. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, it's it's all over Facebook and, you know, at, at the moment there's a lot happening on Facebook. True, excellent. It, um, yeah. Would you guys consider uh, suspending your Facebook accounts? There's a, actually a hashtag going around saying delete Facebook. Would you guys consider doing it to um, protect your data and your personal information? Look, uh, <clears throat> if, if there were an alternative, I would. But I feel like when there's so many people in the world and millions, millions of users on Facebook, I kind of feel as if I'm not really someone that they're going to be, you know, looking through. You the say that, but I do say that, but mass collection of data mm. is very good at controlling masses of people. Yes, I've heard that um, they've been doing fake advertisements for political campaigns. The the 2016 Donald Trump campaign actually was. They, they were using uh, US citizens' data against them to make these fake um, mm. political ads to kind of sway the votes, which yeah. I believe Which is... would be more appealing to whatever demographic they were, well, whatever person. Yeah, it's yeah. it's unbelievable the, the lengths that they go to, to. I think it's quite manipulative, and I think very. that Facebook has a responsibility to everyone who gives them their information to yeah. protect it from, from that happening. Mm. Absolutely. But you wouldn't delete it, Sarah? No, no. I believe that they have everything on me that they want to know. I believe that they can probably hear us right now speaking Shh. through this very microphone. Conspiracy. No, I, Conspiracy. I believe that Facebook knows everything about everyone yeah. and anything and probably Absolutely. things I don't know about myself. Mm. And no one reads the terms and conditions. Well, I don't know of anyone that reads the terms and conditions. <laughs> so when you sign up for Facebook and you download it, you know, it'll say on your phone, do you agree to these or... This, this app is going to access, you know, photos and yeah, messages right. and all of those things. And you just press accept because you're like, you know, it's fine. Yeah. Um, but no, the truth is that they, they do have your photos and your messages. As soon as everything. you upload it, Facebook owns mm. it because you're uploading yeah. it onto a platform. So, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. It's, um, it's quite scary to think that uh, a huge, yeah, with two billion, almost two billion users... Mm. Um, they own everything. Yeah. Yeah. I believe if we deactivated, they would probably come looking for us just well, because we'd be one of the only few people in the world that don't have it. Elon Tusk deleted the Facebook account. You know, Elon Tusk. Yeah. Did that, right. Did I say that yeah. name right? Yeah. Yeah. The Elon Musk. 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 He's the one. The one that he sent deleted his car it. into space. He deleted it and <laughs> yeah. tweeted, what's Facebook? Yeah. So Ooh. he's pretty smart. That's a bold move. That's, yeah. That's a very bold, especially, you know, for someone in his position, very bold move. You 100%, know. yeah. Um, but for such a big platform, I feel as if if Facebook were to lose stock and, and essentially go under in a hypothetical situation, there would be another one to, you know, be built and back up on and... They, I, I suppose, MySpace. Yeah. yeah. We'll rain again. Go, go back to MySpace. <laughs> I never had one. Yeah. Never had one. Anyway. Right, thank you, guys. Th thanks for that, Scarlett. You're with the Morning Journal broadcast. It is 9.08 a.m. This is our first ever episode, so thank you for joining us. You can still tweet us on Twitter at The Morning Journal and catch replays of the show on the big screen in the Agora throughout the week or at upstart.net.au. Coming up on the show, we have filmmaker Angie Black to join us and discuss her feature film, The Five Provocations, which made its international debut yesterday. We also have a message from the content director of Rabelais, Tanique, about their very first edition for 2018. We'll be letting you know what's on this week around campus and in Melbourne so you can start planning your weekend early. And the girls from the Morning Journal hit up some gelati stores so they'll be letting you know some of the wackiest flavours to try. And now we have an instalment of Entertainment Talk for you. Enjoy. Hello and welcome to Entertainment Talk with me, Kate, where I'll be talking about what's new in film and TV every week. As we are celebrating Pride this week at La Trobe, this instalment will look at LGBTQ plus representation in entertainment. First up, I'll be talking about a new film coming out in cinemas on the 29th of March called Love, Simon. The film is about Simon, a seemingly average high school student who is keeping his homosexuality a secret. However, after talking to another closeted student who is anonymously posting online, Simon's secret is threatened to be revealed. A lot of my life is great, except I have one huge ass secret. Hey! 
Have you seen the new post? About the closeted gay kid at school. Who do you think it is? That's all I kind of want to say about what the film is about because I definitely don't want to spoil it. But I will talk about what I liked about this film. Love Simon as a strong lead in Nick Robinson, who you may recognise from Jurassic World. He turns in a powerful performance in the film that endears his character to you. There is also a strong ensemble in the film made up of his family, friends and teachers, with a particularly memorable scene where his friends come out to their parents as straight. I have something I need to tell you. I'm straight. I like girls. You trying to kill me? I like men. Oh God, help me Jesus! Though this film may seem like another run-of-the-mill teen rom-com, Love, Simon is actually special for this reason. Queer cinema has a rich history, with even a recent rise in critical praise through Best Picture winner Moonlight and recent nominee Call Me By Your Name. However, the LGBTQ plus community in film has long shown a strong trend of portraying queer characters as tragic figures. The Children's Hour and A Single Man are a couple examples of that. So the fact that Love, Simon is getting mainstream attention for its positive portrayal of gay characters is important and a clear sign that there is a place for LGBTQ plus voices in entertainment. So if you're interested in seeing Love, Simon, you can check it out in cinemas from the 29th of March. In TV this week, the reality competition show RuPaul's Drag Race has entered into its 10th season. The show, if you're not familiar, is hosted by RuPaul and follows 14 drag queens as they fight for the title of America's Next Drag Superstar. Through a series of acting, designing and lip-sync challenges, Drag Race has managed to become one of the most diverse reality competition shows on television, while also staying socially relevant with its strong representation of queer culture. I'd absolutely recommend checking out this show if you love reality TV. It has all the drama of The Real Housewives and all the talent of shows like The Voice. The show is also made memorable for its legendary lip sync for your life segment at the end of every show where the two bottom queens fight for the right to stay on the show. The time has come to lip sync for your life. The first episode of season 10 which features guest judge Christina Aguilera is already available on streaming service Stan and comes out every Friday. So give it a chance and you definitely won't regret it. In a world full of nines, be a 10. <laughs> Finally, I'm very passionate about old films and think more people should watch films of the past and appreciate them. So every week I'll be recommending a vintage film to watch based on the newer films that I'm talking about. So the film I'll be talking about is The Birdcage. It's of course inspired by the LGBTQ plus representation seen in both Love, Simon and RuPaul's Drag Race. The Birdcage is a 1996 film, which is also based on a 1978 French film called Le Cage Falls, starring Robin Williams and Nathan Lane about a gay nightclub owner and his drag queen partner, whose lives are sort of turn upside down when their son comes home and reveals he is engaged. And they must put on a show for his fiance's ultra conservative parents. Of course, hilarity ensues, and the comedic timing in this movie is absolutely incredible. I'm getting married. <laughs> it's a girl. I, I met her at school. It's this wonderful... Uh, what, what are you... Are you upset? But let me tell you why. Though the film isn't too old, it was only made in 1996, I still chose to talk about this film because it's absolutely hilarious with outstanding performances from its leads, as well as Hank Azaria, who plays the Guatemalan housekeeper. The Birdcage is truly a comedic past that won't soon be forgotten by anyone who watches it, so I definitely recommend you check it out. Well, that's all for this week. See you next time for Entertainment Talk. I cannot wait to see those movies, especially The Birdcage. That's one that I haven't seen, but I feel like I'm going to have to add it now to my list of things to watch. Oh, it definitely. Looks really it looks very entertaining. Yeah, yeah, it looks great. Now, because it's Pride Week, there will be a lot of fun events on around campus at La Trobe University. So this week at La Trobe, there will be a talk of Pride Week on Wednesday. Iman Noor, Australia's first openly gay man. Iman? Um, also on Wednesday, um, you can find the food trucks on the Simpson lawn with this week's food trucks being T-Rex barbecue and Brazilian vibes. There will Yum. also be an ultimate frisbee competition 
um, and many other activities throughout the week. If you want to branch out from La Trobe's campus, there will also be plenty of things on in Melbourne this week. If you haven't been able to get down there yet, check out the NGV Trennial. It's free and it's in the National Gallery of Victoria and it's amazing. As usual, you can also check out the Queen Vic Markets, which runs every Wednesday night up until the 11th of April. They also have some epic pop-ups and live music. Rachel, have you caught any movies lately? The last film I saw in cinemas was Lady Bird and I absolutely adored it. It was such a refreshing film. Um, for those of you who don't know what it is, it's a coming in coming of age film um, and it shows the relationship between uh, mother and daughter. Um, it's set in Sacramento, California um, and it's just, it's so refreshing. I just, I adored it. It was, it was fantastic. Um, definitely Sounds... one to watch. Yeah. Um, have you seen any movies lately? Um, well, the last time I think I watched a movie was on my plane ride back to Melbourne. I was watching um, Limitless. Have you seen that movie before? I haven't seen that movie. What's it about? It's about pretty much um, a guy who has nothing and he's probably going nowhere but finds a drug that gives him the ultimate power to become successful. He gets himself together, he becomes really intelligent and he does a lot with his ability that he could never do before just because of this one drug. It's kind of like the secret steps to success in my opinion mm -hmm. on how to turn it around and change everything Isn't he had a drug to do that but yeah That's it was the dream yeah you know, take a pill you, you have a feeling study, just yeah. instantly successful that's mm. great yeah I yeah. think one of my my all-time favorites would be uh Anchorman yeah oh, yeah yeah 100 percent journalism funny. dream Cultural. right there he was here for the the Australian Open not too long ago oh yes yes yeah. he was in town yes they did a couple of skits on tv it was just it oh was really it would have been funny. comic yeah. genius yeah, yeah. He yeah. does some great films. Another film to look out for at the moment is a new feature film called The Five Provocations. It was screened yesterday in Melbourne, so have a look. Okay. I love you too, Rosie. You're never going to tell Queenie about us, are you? Sorry, I'm filthy. <laughs> Let me just go wash up. Oh <laughs> my god. I guess we've all got our secrets. Who's got a secret? So that film looks just incredible and I can't wait to see it. We have the one and only Angie Black here with us now. Angie, thank you for joining us. How are you doing today? You had the screening yesterday? I had the screening yesterday and then they had the closing night party. So right. I'm feeling on top of the world. Yeah, yeah. A bit <laughs> tired but excited. A little bit tired, yeah. yes, yes. But no glad worries. it's over. So that's good. It yeah. was a bit, you know, first mm. time you screen it in front of a, pu a public paying audience. So yeah. you're like... Okay, hope yeah. this goes well. Let's see what happens in the audience. But yeah, um, yeah it was great. Absolutely. Um, the five provocations were sold out yesterday. What was the feeling like? Uh, well, the feeling beforehand is really great when you sell out because yeah. you go, yay. <laughs> um, so that was good. We actually sold out twice, which was fantastic. They, they had us in the smaller Acme cinema to begin with. Right. Um, and we sold out in less than two days. So they were, they rang me and went, so can we talk a deal? I went, yes, we can. <laughs> um, and which was great. So they bumped a documentary about Ian McKellen out of the big cinema, which I feel pretty bad because it's uh, Ian McKellen and I bumped yeah. him out of that cinema. And he went into the small cinema and we got the bigger cinema. So that meant that they could sell another 200 tickets. Oh, that's great. Right. Um, so that was a little terrifying because you go, oh, now there's 400 people we have to show it to, you know, and <laughs> right. oh, okay, and get up and chat in front of. But, mm -hmm. um, but it was, yeah, it was great. And, and, you know, I mean, I'm sitting there still with my filmmaker hat on going, I just hope this film plays and there's no technical problems and it's in sync and we haven't tested it because we only right. just finished it. So, um, so I actually couldn't you know, sit back and just relax until yeah. about halfway through the film and I went, I think it's 
It's still very I think we're okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I understand you've been working on this film for about five years. Yeah. What was the process like? Well, that was that's the exciting part about this film mm. was um, being able to do a different process to what the normal industry way of making a film is, because we it was just a group of passionate people that got together and went, well, why don't we just you know why don't we just see how far we get until someone says we can't keep going anymore. Okay. Um, and that didn't happen, which was fantastic. So I started by um, just working with four actors to begin with and individually. So they didn't know who else was involved in the film. And I sat down with each of them and I said, so I've got this idea where we'll start, you know, we'll make a script, but um, I won't write the script until we've really developed these characters. So we spent two years working on their characters. Um, wow. and, and what that meant was, you know, okay, so what character do you, have you always wanted to play but no one's ever cast you in? And they've gone, really, can we do this? And I was like, yeah, we can do this, you know, yeah. why not? Um, which was fantastic because for the actors to be involved in that process was great. Because, you know, often they get typecast in things and you know female actors particularly end up getting cast as mothers and wives and yeah. it's like I don't mind if you're a mother and wife but you've got to have mm. something else going on you know yeah. you can't that we all do we have yeah. a million things going on in our lives as well as being mothers and wives um, so that was great and so I worked with them for four years on character and then I started to introduce so we'd go out and do um, Improvisation. So, okay, in character, go out into the world, buy yourself a coffee, sit down, see if anyone comes up and chats to you, but stay in character. And then when you come back, you know, um, to the house, you know, start to come out of character and we'll sit down and talk about how it went. And that was great. From, the, from that, I started planning things in the background about how the script could work. Um, and then... And then I guess what happened after that was um, I introduced the characters to each other in improvisations. So they didn't know who else was going to be involved in the story. And I was like, oh, okay. So one of the characters had to had money problems and needed a housemate. So I actually got some Latrobe students to play really unusually bad really? characters that you wouldn't want to live with. And I got them to come and, and do house interviews. Yeah. And then I had that one character who plays Bridget come and mm -hmm. actually do a house interview as well and then at the end I said to the character that needed the housemate so which one out of that batch will you actually want to live with and she was like you're kidding they are the worst group of people I could ever possibly <laughs> want to live with right I understand that you you were your daughter as well as in the film Olive uh, what yep. was it like working with your daughter well that was a bit of a risk because she was eight at the time and I was like oh you know, do you think you want to do this? Yeah, yep. Yeah. And then I was like, oh, but she's, you know, only been on set once. Yeah. Uh, she'd done a short film for a friend of mine. Mm. Um, and and I was like, oh, mate, you know, that was that went well because I wasn't there, you know, and sometimes it's better if, yeah. you know, you, you're not there. Yeah. Um, and I was like, oh, are you sure you want to do this? And she's like, yeah, yeah, I'm good. And just a bit too cool about it. And I was like, it's going to be a meltdown at some point. But there just wasn't, you know. Um, yeah. She walked down on set and she was nervous because she didn't know yeah. everybody and everyone's mm. looking at her. And yeah. I'm, like, I'm like, you know what? They're actually not looking at you. Like, they're looking at the lighting. They're looking at your wardrobe. They're yeah. actually not looking at you. That's yeah. the thing with actors. You know, you get used to it. Um, and I was very lucky because the lead character... Um, Sir Peter Kian is a dramaturg and she tr teaches acting at VCA and so they spend a bit of time on having you know building their relationship because those two characters had to be really close and because she knew them and pretty much everyone working on the film were mates mm -hmm. so you yeah, know she sort of felt comfortable yeah, yeah yeah and then she's just loved hanging out with all the Latrobe interns. She was like, yeah. I'm damn, these are my peeps. I yeah. love it. You know, I was like, oh no, I've created a monster. You know? <laughs> oh, that sounds great. So do you mind just telling us a bit about those characters and, and the film? Yeah. Without giving too much away, because we're yep. all going to go and see it. Yep. Well, hopefully. Um, so, I mean, really the story, it's an ensemble film. So the four characters intertwine with each other and um, it's really about 
overcoming grief and loss. So I didn't want the film to be about anything terrible that happens in people's lives. You know, it's it's sort of the aftermath of, you know, a, a terrible event, and and usually that's where films end. You know. Um, so I wanted to pick it up there and go, well, what happens in our normal lives? Like, what happens when, you know, in our day-to-day, how do we deal with just everything that goes on and all the secrets we have and we don't tell other people about and, right. you know. Yeah. Um, so that was the idea of doing character stories was mm. that you'd only meet these characters uh, in their worlds from their perspective. And you sort of, it's interesting then to see where they go into somebody else's world because how you feel about that character changes when you meet them through somebody else's eyes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's that's what we wanted to do. So everyone's got their own stuff they're dealing with and it's they sort of overlap, but it's you see it from a different perspective. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like yeah. everyone thinks, because we're the centre of our own worlds, everyone thinks, you know, your own drama is the worst, but you forget to realise yeah. how it impacts on other people and yeah. whether they've got stuff. Yeah. yeah. No. I did actually watch uh, Birthday Girl. Oh, um, that's a cheery up and, film too. <laughs> well, <laughs> you were talking about uh, grief and and um, and it was so powerful because it's it's for those of you watching, it's just shot in an elevator and it it looks like a, a hospital. Um, and it was a Latrobe elevator. A, a Latrobe yeah. elevator. <laughs> um, and it's it's about this mother who is dealing with uh, the loss of her child, who I think was eight, yeah. um, and just the the whole. It's I think it's about seven minutes, and it's just shot in in the one elevator, and you know you don't see anything gruesome. There's no you know tragic scenes, but it's just the emotion of this mother's face, and it was just so powerful. And I feel like you know in in this film um, you would have similar themes. And, and yeah, that's uh, yeah. Tr- yeah, that's it's. I mean, I sort of don't, you know, as a filmmaker, you sort of don't sit down going, oh, I'm going to make a film about grief. Yeah. But it's sort of, you know, that was the interesting thing about this film was, I suppose, you know, the lead actor was overcoming grief. And then I thought, oh, this is really good because, you know, one of the other characters also was like, oh, you know, his wife had died and then I went, oh, I could connect these two in a backstory in a very interesting way. And um, and grief is a big part of our life. Like, you know, everyone dies and everyone's experienced it. So, um, and how we process that is different for everybody. So, um, yeah, Birthday Girl was, was really interesting because I didn't, I wanted to play around with... Um, horror but I I didn't want to do like a scary boo hey watch out behind you horror I wanted to do you know just creating a mood and a vibe where you're sort of just going "Mm, it's just really uncomfortable yeah more intensity yeah and there's a you know a writer who I love who writes Japanese horror in such an amazing way and um and I was just like oh yeah I just want to be able to capture what he writes and and you know put it in a film and whether or not you can do that eh? yeah yeah um, you know, you're a mum, a filmmaker, a, stu- uh, a director. How do you balance this busy lifestyle? <laughs> no, you <don't>. yeah. <laughs> Good question. But you do. You you balance it because you have to. Um, yeah. 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 It, it's you know, I mean, things have to fall by the wayside because you just can't do it all, and right. it is you just learn to prioritise. And I mean, I'm sure this is the same with you guys. You've got four subjects all at once. And, you know, you've all got social lives and you've got family commitments and, you know, it's just, you just, um, at some point you just go, okay, well, what's important? You know, I can't go to every party. I can't go to everything, you know, um, as much as you'd like to. And you just, you know, you just can't, you can't do it all. So, yeah, you just learn to prioritise about, you know, and and planning. I think planning is good. Having a schedule. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Get all the the timetables ready before you start semester, yeah, and make absolutely. sure you know what you're doing. Yeah. I am a bit late to the party, so I haven't bought a planner yet, but I'll <laughs> I'll, I'll get there. Oh, my planner um, is my best friend. My best friend. <laughs> yeah. Is, yeah, it's beautiful. It's completely set. I take the time and I plan my weeks. If I don't, may go mentally insane. But that's no, it's all. it's so true, isn't it? It's yeah. like if you can see it in front of you. I'm such so, a visual person, so yeah, I just yeah. need it in front of me, yeah, and I yeah. go. 
Okay, all right. And then when I don't do something I'm meant to have done, I just move that block of colour somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. you know, I go, okay, that's getting close to the deadline, but yeah. we'll make it work, yeah. Mm. Um, you've also done work in advertising, creating shorter feature films and things like that. So how does that compare to making the longer story filmmaking part of it? Well, ads are just, you know, storytelling, but in a 30 second time slot. Right. So, you know, I still approach it exactly the same way. Um, it's a pretty strict time slot. So yeah. if they say 30 seconds, it has to be exactly 30 seconds. Right. Um, and yeah, but it's, it's the same process. You work with actors, um, you know, you block it, you work with great, you usually have a lot more gear because yeah. there's a lot more money. And that's always fun. You go, how can we get this crane shot in here? <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, but it's a great way to learn your craft because you are up against strict, you know, time restrictions, and and you know that just enforces you to have to think on the fly. When mm. something doesn't work, you've just got to get creative and go. You know, you can't not deliver as a paying client, and they expect something. So you know, filmmaking is really just about. Mm mediating all the things that go wrong you go out with a plan and you just and then it all goes haywire right and you go oh okay so ads are great because you've got huge crews and you've got heaps of pressure and when things go wrong you just have to make it work and look like you've got it all under control but inside yeah. you're going <laughs> i think that's just everyday life really. yeah it is yes <laughs> So do you have any more new sort of works in the making? I know you've just screened this one, but uh, I know you've any always, big plans for the Yeah, future? there's always something, mm. yeah. Um, so actually I wrote a script for my Masters um, and because uh, I did my Masters in screenwriting. Right. And, um, and so that script's ready to go. Well, right. not, it's ready to have another draft and I'm going to bring a writer in this time who... Um, uh, who's the writer of Clever Man and, you know, great series, Australian series. And she's agreed to do the next draft, so we've just got to put that in for funding. We've got a really great producer. So I'm, I'm, yeah. letting, I'm letting go and, and <laughs> passing on roles to other people, which right. is really nice. <laughs> yeah, exciting. Yeah. And yeah, good, good to kind of sit back and see, I guess, what other people are going to do with that Absolutely. script as well. Yeah, Because yeah. Yeah. Yeah, film's sure. such a great medium to collaborate in, so mm. it's really nice to have people that, you know. Yeah. yeah have their creative input. How do you think your film relates to the LGBTIQ community? Um, yeah, that's interesting because somebody asked us that at the Q&A after, well, they asked us a similar question, you know, like, did you have an audience in mind? And I have to say, we didn't. I guess we were making, we were just making a film that spoke to us and you kind of forget you're queer, you know, you're just getting on with your life and you're doing your thing. And, you know, it's sort of a slice of life, you know, in a North Melbourne. Mm. And um, and it was funny, you know, somebody watched it and they were like, oh, okay, is it queer enough to be in a queer film festival? I was like, oh, what are you talking about? Of course it is. What? You know, um, and in some ways you just go, well, you know, I think probably queer cinema for so long has been so issue-based that we're kind of almost getting to the point where we're past that now. It's just yeah. like can't we just, yeah. you know, get on and with our lives yeah. now? We don't yeah. have to be banging on about yeah. things because so much of that work is already being done by amazing, incredible, fabulous people. Um, and, and there's still heaps of issues that yep. we have to address, but not every film has to be about that. Yeah, yes. I think it's also very exciting for the, the uh, local filmmaking community as well that, you know, there's these Australian producers and directors and they're making and... You yeah. know, your screening sold out and it's all very exciting for the community. Hopefully, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's really hard to make feature films. In Australia, you know, we, st we still pump out about, I don't know, 20 to 30 feature films a year. Mm. Uh, and a lot of them are just, you know, blood, sweat and tears. And yeah. you kind of forget how much goes into it until you're in it. And then you're going, yeah. why are we doing this? This is really hard yeah. Yeah. But, um, But, yeah, yeah, it is good. And, and I think, you know, films... It's getting easier to make films, really, um, because of the gear and equipment. So it means that more people can have access to them. But, you know, easier in that regard, but it's not always easy to follow your passion. It's always yeah. hard and, you know, creative process is always fraught with, you know, problems. And yeah. 
but it's still great that lots more people are uh, have the opportunity now to get out and make stuff if they want to. Which and is there great. are brilliant films out there as well. Yeah, there yeah. are. There's some really great stuff mm. coming out now. Yeah. Mm. So it was just an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank thank you. you for having me in. We look forward to seeing more of your work in the future with that that script. Yeah, 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 hopefully. Yeah, yeah no absolutely. fate. We'll just, we'll just <laughs> that last little plug. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now in spirit of Pride Week, Tanique, our very own senior producer and contact director of La Trobe's Rabelais, uh, has a message for us. Hi everyone, I'm Sneek, the content director for Rabelais, which is La Trobe's very own student-run magazine. In association with Pride Week, today we have the LGBTQ version of Rabelais being released. Feel free to go and pick up a copy from the La Trobe Student Union. It's for free and it features a whole bunch of artworks by people like myself and everyone on campus that has submitted an article or a piece of art to make this amazing magazine. So yeah, go and pick one up and enjoy the morning journal. I can't wait to read the first edition of the 2018 Rabelais. It sounds great and a really good thing to get involved in. Absolutely. And for those just tuning into the show, you're with the Morning Journal broadcast. It is 9.36am. This is our very first episode. So thank you for joining us. You can still tweet us on Twitter at the Morning Journal. Did you guys Journal. turn your headphones down? What? They were on be back soon. Oh. Because uh, your headphones are down and I can't yes. talk to you. Oh. No, it's, it's, it's only because we were trying to talk to Angie and we couldn't hear. Oh, okay. Yeah. Can you turn me up? Yes. Which one? Which one are you? Yeah. The second one, right? This one? Can you hear me? SJ, now? can you? Just wait. It's only because when she plays the packages, it's just too loud. Yeah. Hello. And tell Alicia to turn it on. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Hello. Uh, can we hear just it? Can we it. just hear it because where the door's are we, open? Where are we going from? Um, we're going to start now from Scarlett's newsroom. Okay. Her news, like, summary. And okay. Whether I think you know. Yep. Oh, I'm just going to talk about cycling. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Just do a quick... Sorry, um, That's where we're going from, <laughs> all right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, we're running Don't apologise. We're running a bit ahead because yeah. your discussion went for, like, two minutes or seven minutes. That's right. We've got this. Um, yeah. So just take your time. What's going to happen? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye. Bye, Ajay. Um, yeah, okay? Alright, sweet. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to get And welcome back. Just with a quick recap on the news headlines from this morning. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg's Facebook data scandal is making news all over the world with a mass privacy breach. 50 million users' uh, personal information was shared with the data company Cambridge Analytica. The scandal could be the tip of the iceberg for Facebook's privacy breaches as investigations continue. Australian cricket captain... Steve Smith has stepped down after television cameras caught his, um, his teammate attempting to cheat by ball tampering. Public fellow, uh, figures and fellow cricketing legends have condemned the actions of the Australian cricket team and Australia has made global news as cheetah cheetah pumpkin eaters. Now Australia is the Australian response to America's Time's Up campaign. Professionals from the media and entertainment e industry are gathering together to make solutions for the issue of sexual harassment in the workplace. Citizens in the US have taken to the streets across the country to a protest gun violence which took the lives of 17 people in yet another school in Florida earlier this year. And finally to weather, residents in far north Queensland are bracing for more heavy rainfall today after ex-tropical cyclone Nora. Emergency, emergency services crews have received more than 100 call-outs for help 
and went through 10 tonnes of sand during the flash flooding in Cairns and Port yeah. Douglas region. The weather comes as the low tropical um, low remains stationary over land near Kurumba, west of Cairns, after the cyclone made landfall on Saturday night near Pompura and the West Cape York Peninsula. And that's all from the headlines. Thanks for that, Scarlett. And while it might be a bit chilly, it's never too cold for ice cream. Isn't that right, Sarah? Oh, no, I believe any time is ice cream time. Um, so some of our TMJ team have had a look around Ligon Street to find some wacky gelati flavours, and here's what they found in the gelati packet. Melbourne's Little Italy, known as the famous Ligon Street, is renowned for their artisan gelaterias. Hi guys, we're at Ligon Street right now when we're about to check out some quirky and odd gelati flavours. So come on and we'll go have a look and see what we can find. We visited Casa del Gelato, which is one of Melbourne's oldest gelaterias. Established in 1980 by Ottonio Pace, now run by his grandson Eric Pace, Casa del Gelato is known for their flavoursome gelatis. The history of Casa del Gelato has been for more than uh, 35 years. Uh, they're an Italian uh, family and we have more than 60 flavours. I would say the most unique flavours that we have are probably jasmine, it's a sobe, uh, uh, chili chocolate, um, licorice, you can't really find it um, elsewhere, uh, probably zuppa inglese, uh, zabaione, which is yolk with uh, sparkling wine, marsala, uh, also ricotta cheese, it tastes like cheesecake or condensed milk. Thank you. Tastes like milk, like condensed milk. That's good. That one's good. <laughs> Casa del Gelato opens its doors to many Melburnians from 12 midday to 12 midnight. Walking into Gelatissimo, which is located on 197 Ligon Street, Kelton, you are automatically overwhelmed with delight. Gelatissimo is an artisan gelato company where the gelato is made freshly every day. We roughly get about 400 transactions that could be anywhere between a whole family or just one person throughout a day. So we get pretty busy here in Ligon Street. With a range of old school classics to quirky, interesting flavours, Gelatissimo uses the best natural ingredients. At the moment we have froggies and koala, and that is a blend of milk chocolate, caramel koalas, just a lot of sweetness, things that Australians like, something that can relate to everyone. Their secret traditional Calabrian family recipes have created award-winning flavoursome gelatis. Uh, basically this is the gelato machine. Uh, what you used to do is just put the milk on top. We pasteurize the milk so we arrive like 85 degrees. And then the milk comes in the freezer in the bottom. And we put like uh, all the all fruits or like all the ingredients that make to make the gelato basically. If you've ever, um, you know, bored on a sunny night, get down to Gelatissimo, the staff are great and, you know, it's a great customer service. Ice cream discoverers SJ, Sarah Jane, and Jasmine. Um, Thank you for joining hello. us. I'm so keen for gelati right now. I really want to try that jasmine flavor. Mm. It was unique. Unique? Unique. It's like it was sweet, but I expected it to taste like a flower. And I don't know what right. a flower tastes like, so no. <laughs> what did it like? I actually forgotten what it tasted like. It was like a sorbet. To me, it tasted like when you know when you have like a pavlova or a meringue and you know oh, that yeah. white egg yeah. sort of taste? Mm. That's tasted the best like that. part. Um it was like a bit interesting to taste like all these different flavours. Mm. Um, like by the end of the day, we had tasted what, 40 odd gelati flavours <laughs> and it was just too much for the stomach, I think. Did you not have dinner that night then, I'm assuming? No, we still ate. Yeah, we still had dinner, <laughs> Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> love that. But love that. like, yeah, it was it was interesting. What what flavour did you like, Jazz? So at Gelatissimo, mm. I really liked, I think it was the blood orange. Oh yum. Mm. Yeah. I'm a big I've, fan of orange. I've had one of those at Messina mm. in Collingwood. So good. Like, it was I love the citrus flavours. Yeah, and um so the guy that we interviewed, Sam, said that was his favourite flavour. So obviously mm. that was the first one I tried. 
and Casa del Gelato, I think my favorite was the jasmine, but only because it's my name. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so at Casa del Gelato, I tasted this chocolate chili ice cream. Oh. Now, when you eat it, like when you first put it in your mouth, it's pure chocolate. And then about three seconds into it, you get this like chili taste and it's like it's like a explosion in your mouth. It was actually nice. So if you're ever feeling a bit adventurous, Go down to Casa del Gelato and get the chocolate, ch the chocolate chili. It's a bit of a tongue twister, like chocolate yeah. chili, chocolate chili. <laughs> and um, what else? There was that jazz, that ricotta one, or the condensed yeah. milk. What was that called again? Uh, I can't remember, but it, it was like pure cheesecake flavour. Yeah. It was very oh, strong. It was amazing. Right. Yeah. Licorice wow. was an odd one. Yeah. That was like super strong. Is there yeah. any one that you found that was just like you couldn't even taste it, like you just didn't like it whatsoever, couldn't eat it? Yeah, the... Um, the the no the one at um, gelatissimo the one with the I, I threw she it had up. it was like oh l lime and coconut lime no, and coconut something that's like it. that yeah that sounds like really a nice combination. No, yeah, that guys, sounds nice guys the coconut and the lime it's just too much in your mouth uh, yes. yeah yeah I mm. I feel like the chocolate chili one would be kind oh, of too much know. for me I yeah. cannot handle my spice like <laughs> I don't eat even if there's like a tiny bit of chili flake like in soup or whatever like I cannot handle it and I just yeah, yeah. I'm like that with minty flavours. I find that I shouldn't be eating something I should be chewing or brushing my teeth with. It just makes me feel kind of icky inside. It's like swallowing toothpaste for yeah. me. I mean, so. in Melbourne just has like the most amazing different gelati places. Yeah. Like there's there's always like Instagram ready, you know. Yeah. It's always on my social media. There's just, there's Messina and there's Gelati Papa and mm. there's oh, so, so many. many. Yeah. There's one called Minnows that I've been meaning to try for like ever because yeah. my mum's in love with it. And <laughs> yeah. so, yeah, it's just, I definitely have to go out into the city and kind of oh, explore yeah. because there's, you know, the, there's always a mood for ice cream. Yeah, on Ligon Street, there's one, it's called Pita Pippa and they literally drag and put and pour Nutella all over your ice cream and it's just amazing. It's just an amazing experience. Like we yeah. only saw two places. We yeah. wish you could have seen more, but like the stomach. Yeah. 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 Like <laughs> too, too much to handle. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of um a lot of dairy. Um but basically the both um Sam and um, I forgot David, David, David. David. they were beautiful. Mm. Like they were, they actually made our gelati experience so memorable. Oh, beautiful um, people. They were just so not lovely and just so great to talk to. And um, at Gelatissimo, they make the ice creams fresh every day. So they have um, that machine that Francesco we saw in the package. Mm. Um, he every day goes in there in the morning and makes it fresh. So oh it's beautiful. Yeah, that mm. would just, that's just... I need to go out and eat some gelati <laughs> yeah, after this show. As soon as it finishes, I'm just going to go straight down <laughs> to, to Ligon Street and yeah. check out those flavours. Um, actually, we're going to revisit Angie's trailer now. Oh, sounds um, like a great You can idea. actually find it on thefiveprovocations.com if you want to see it, if you girls want to see it. Yeah. Screened yesterday. Oh. Fantastic Love film. Love Angie. Sold yeah. out. Oh, yeah. Anyway, here we go. No worries. I love you too, Rosie. You're never going to tell Queenie about us, are you? Sorry, I'm filthy. <laughs> Let me just go wash up. Oh <laughs> my God. I guess we've all got our secrets. Who's got a secret? Com, or you can find Andy's other works at Black Eye Films, um, which is a fantastic, fantastic 
um, production company. I was uh, having a look yesterday at her old short films. Um, there's one called Disnature that's just incredible. Oh, okay. um, and yeah, she founded it in 1999, I think. So it's, yeah. She's Isn't it great that nowadays we can, you know, record all our stuff and document it and put it online so we can track our progress and everybody can access it. It's just great. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. And you can find all of our stuff at The Morning Journal. We're on Instagram and Twitter. Yes. So um, tweet us if you have any suggestions, questions, yeah. or even things that you want us to talk about and show on The Morning Channel. Yeah. We've put up a couple of things already yes, uh, from this morning because it's our off. first episode. How yes. are you going with that? I'm just... Um, you know what? I think we've done pretty good. I yeah. really love like um, the vibe of the show and the people are great to work yeah. with. Um, I'm really looking forward to what's ahead for yeah. us. Um, we, have, so. we have an all-female team. Yes, um, yeah. So it makes for a very exciting show. Yeah, a lot great of dynamic. Discussion. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So we're going to be talking about a lot of films and what's on and, and really – you know, some just great discussions to have every week here yeah. at 9am every Monday. Yes, so yeah. don't forget if you have any suggestions or questions or even just want to feedback on the show, just tweet us or Instagram us at The Morning Journ. Um, we do actually um, check it quite often, so yeah, yeah it'll be great. Um, there are also some other shows going on at La Trobe. If you didn't know, we are a program called La Trobe Live, and this is just one of the shows, yeah. but I understand that I think there are two other teams coming on this week yes. uh, to do their shows. There's one tomorrow, and I think there's a Wednesday team as well. Yes, so keep um, tuning in to La Trobe Live. You will yeah. see different faces going around. Absolutely. Again, we are the morning journ. Yes. So we're going to be joined by Bill Bainbridge. He is actually um, the the lecturer, the runner of yep, the, the coordinator of the, of shows, the, Trobe the Live. coordinator, um, as well as you know Bridget McCarthy. I, she won't be joining us, but she is the coordinator of La Trobe yes. Live as well. So shout out to her; she's fantastic. Um, yeah, so he'll just be coming in, having a chat with us about the show. Can't wait to have him on. Yeah, um, yeah. It'll yeah. be great. Yeah, 100%. Just, yep. Wouldn't be um, a team without Bridget or Bill, so we thank them no. very much and we appreciate their help throughout the yes. way of producing The Morning yeah, Journey. So these, welcome, Bill. Mm, these shows have actually been in the works for a few weeks now. So, yeah, we've done all of the behind the scenes and with our first episode, this is, yeah. Yeah, it's quite it's all, a... it's all coming into, yep. into play right now. Yeah. Bill, how are you? I'm good. How are you? We're great. We're, we're going. <laughs> we're going. You're going? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So um, do you want to talk a bit about La Trobe Live and, yep. and what we do here each week? Mm. Uh, yeah. So this is, this is our first one this semester. This facility opened last year and we had three programs uh, running all of second semester out of, out of here and up on the big screen. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll be doing the same thing this year. Um, mm -hmm. You guys are the first one. Uh, we've got one uh, at midday tomorrow and midday on Wednesday. We'll have uh, programs as well. So the idea is a magazine program that really is, you know, by students and uh, to communicate with with other students here yeah. on campus. Students and uh, yeah, we're being broadcast on upstart.net.au. Yeah, that's right. Um, and also on the big screen in the Agora. So everyone walking past us right now can uh, can kind of look in and see what uh, the show's yeah, all about. Rumour is there was actually people sitting and watching in really? the egg earlier. So yes, oh, as she, they should be, as yes. they yeah. should be. That's as, what I would be doing if I was yes. in the Gora at this time in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I'm actually an old cookie. I was... It's so great to have the Media Hub as a facility mm. now. Um, I was doing La Trobe Live early last year when we were back in the Humanities Building right. with with Phil. Yeah. Um, and so we kind of had sort of a podcast style show. And so it's really amazing to see this new facility now and how the shows have developed and how, mm. you know, we've got these teams now and... And, you know, the, the facilities and cameras and, yeah, it's, it's really cool to, to have this room and, yeah, Absolutely. like it's, it's great to have it open because I, I remember it was, uh, it was still in the making last year and we're all really eager to get in here and, and do our shows. So, yeah. yeah. From the yeah. HU Teal building to now, what do you see as progression for the La Trobe Live? I, I mean, just the, the, the facility, um, the facility is the real progression. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's quite different doing it here where you're actually integrated with the campus, you can be seen by other students. Uh, you, you know, I mean, I think the, the feeling if you're, uh, if you were down in the old facility is that you were, it was isolated, you were yeah. doing it just for your, just for yourselves and just for the experience of putting mm -hmm. something together. But I, I think here, you know, it really shows other students what this 
faculty is doing yeah. and, and what the journalism students are doing. And it really makes it part of the campus life, which is what, yeah. you know, producing TV is about. You're producing Absolutely. it for an audience. You're not you're not just doing it for yourselves. So, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you, you know, it really uh, reaches out to, to people here. And, and, you know, hopefully uh, you've got sort of uh, eight weeks of this, you can build an audience right. over that time. Absolutely. Um, and I understand that, you know, you've got a lot going on outside of mm. uni. Do you mind telling us a bit about what you do? Uh, yes, yeah, so mainly I produce um, two programs, one of two mm. programs at the, for the ABC. So we're on the news channel. Yeah. It used to be called News 24. We're not allowed to call it that anymore. It's the news channel. Mm. Uh, so I work on The World, um, which is a late night, 10 p.m., uh, hosted by Bev O'Connor. It's a, a world news wrap. So we do, uh, you know, top stories of the day, global stories of the day with interviews, three to four interviews, um, you know, off analysts usually, but sometimes we get other people. We had Kate Blanchett last week and we had Ban Ki-moon and uh, we had Mohammed Mahathir, who was the uh, former Prime Minister mm -hmm. of Malaysia the week before. So, uh, yeah. yes, we that that's um, a, a late night news bulletin. And then I also do, um, more often at the moment, I'm doing the 2300 bulletin, which is a national bulletin it's a good it's good news bulletin because um, uh, you know if you're just watching your state news or even if you're watching the news channel uh, the bulletins are shorter and you just get the main stories of the the day because we do this uh, hour-long bulletin uh, at 11 o'clock uh, you know we can really wrap the whole country so you get those stories those little stories out of Tasmania or Northern Territory, which are, yeah. are you know, great yarns, really mm. interesting for a national audience, but usually don't get seen outside their own Right, and I feel state. like that's what we need as well, you know, some, something that um, we don't get to see often that we can catch up on. And I feel like short bulletins are really what I need, uh, especially studying uni and everything. Um, it's, it's good to have sort of snippets of things rather than, yeah. you know, for people who don't have the time to sit down and watch, you know, a whole hour yeah. of, of yeah. something. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's good to So, I mean, I think once. that's the way, uh, you know, news is going in a lot of ways. You need to, uh, because people want news wherever they are, yeah. when, when it suits them. Yeah. You know, there used to be a culture of sort of appointment viewing. Yeah. You had a, a 6 p.m. or a 7 p.m. bulletin and the family would sit down mm -hmm. together and watch that and that was your one wrap mm -hmm. of news for the day. You know, uh, the, it's changed dramatically. If you look at th those or those bulletins, still pull, pull the biggest audiences. Right. So that's still the dominant way for people in Australia to get their news. Yeah. Um, but those scooty audiences skew much, much older. Mm. So that that habit for people of your age and yeah. you know in the in that sort of sub thirty five category, the habit has has changed dramatically. People aren't sitting down just to watch the bulletin. Uh, they're getting news on on Twitter or social media or or, or by tuning in to uh, the news channel during the day. So you don't need that wrap of the past 24 hours. People, um, if you're following a story, you're up to date on that story. So Absolutely. Th th you know, we need now to have a lot more uh, variety in the way we deliver mm -hmm. news to people, whether it's, you know, a short, punchy, something that you can just bring up on your or on your phone. Yep. But also that sort of more extended bulletin for, for people who will sit down yep. and, and watch yep. a full hour. And see, people are so used to just getting out their phones now and kind of scrolling mm. through Twitter and, and getting the headlines off their phones. So, yeah, it's there's there's a lot to adapt to in this industry now um, mm. in, in terms of, you know, how to get their news. Mm. Um, so with, like, my, my family, we often watch uh, ABC News mm. Channel. Why has it changed from 24? <laughs> oh, uh, you know, <coughs> this is a decision made in Sydney. I don't know. They, just, they just someone they, just decided. Yeah, to... they did a rebranding of all of the. Right. Uh, you know, it used to be ABC One and ABC Two. Mm -hmm. They did a rebranding of them all, and they just right. decided to. So just keep to, it sort of. Yes, fresh um, and yes, and absolutely. let's be honest, we're not actually on. We don't actually run twenty four hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you get up in the middle of the night, you're seeing reruns or uh, or yeah. or little bits of BBC. So. Uh, so it's probably also an acknowledgement that um, uh, yes, it's not it's not really twenty four hours, yeah. not yet. Just news news yes. channel, yes. yeah. Well, okay. thank you so much for joining us, Bill. Um, just Pleasure. any final advice for starting out media students? 
Uh, no, I mean, my advice would be, you know, if you're interested in broadcast, do this subject and do BEJ because, uh, you know, there's only so much you can get out of writing essays. If, if you're interested in being involved in, in broadcast, you really need to actually experience doing it. Uh, the, the theory uh, is, is great, but it's the mm. practice that, that really is, is what's going to you know, get you a head start on it. Yeah, yeah. thank you for that. joining us. Pleasure. I feel like there is a lot to, to learn and you know, it comes out in the practice, but unfortunately we've reached the end of our broadcast for today. But remember, you can find out where to watch Angie's film at thefiveprovocations.com, uh, but we'll be back next Monday at 9am. Yeah, um, and don't forget to tweet us or Instagram us at The Morning Journey. Thanks guys. <laughs>